Good morning, everybody. Let's get started. So welcome to the High Energy Density Science Center seminar series. Uh, I'm pleased to have with us today, Dr. Hans G. Rindernick, who is an experimental physicist with research interests in laser-driven fusion, kinetic plasma physics, plasma nuclear physics, and relativistic laser plasma interactions. He received a bachelor's in physics with honors from Princeton University in 2008 and his PhD in plasma physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2015. The title of his thesis was Studies of Non-Hydrodynamic Processes in ICF Implosions on Omega and the National Emission Facility. From 2015 to 2018, he was a Lawrence Postdoctoral Fellow at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he studied the kinetic structure of collisional plasma shocks, the magnetic structure of astrophysical collisionless shocks, and advanced nuclear diagnostic techniques for the NIF ICF program. While there, Hans organized the first kinetic physics in ICF workshop at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in 2016, and co-organized the second kinetic physics in ICF workshop in Santa Fe in 2018. He joined the experimental division of the Laboratory for Laser Energetics in 2018, where he developed a knock-on deuteron imaging diagnostic for hotspot and cold fuel imaging of laser direct drive ICF experiments on Omega. And he presented, presently leads the Relativistic Laser Plasma Experiments Group with the goal of developing short pulse laser plasma experimental efforts at LLE. And it's great to have him back uh, to give us this little talk. And I'm very much looking forward to it. I just uh, note that um, today's talk is being recorded. So if you're not comfortable with that, uh, please log off. And also it is an unclassified meeting. So um, with people logged in from externally to the lab, uh, so please be aware of any classification and export control issues. Um, and also uh, please enter any questions you have in the chat field or just signal to me that you'd like to ask your question orally. And um, I will read any questions at the end. Otherwise, please take it away, Hans, and I look forward to it. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, as Paul said, I am going to be talking about relativistically transparent magnetic filaments. Uh, this is a research project that we've been developing uh, here at LLE in collaboration uh, with a variety of people, including Alex Arefiev, who presented last week. Uh, so there may be some overlap with that, but um, hopefully it's still uh, interesting to you. Uh, so this is a short pulse platform for megatesla fields, direct electron acceleration, and efficient gamma radiation. So what am I talking about here? So the way that this works is if we have a laser interacting with the plasma and the laser is sufficiently intense, uh, then that laser can uh, penetrate into the plasma, even if the plasma is above the critical density, uh, which would normally reject the laser light. Uh, in this case, uh, again, with a sufficiently intense laser, that laser would drive a relativistic current filament in the plasma. That current filament will produce azimuthal magnetic fields that wrap around it, uh, and those magnetic fields will trap electrons. Uh, so, in the, so these trapped electrons in this magnetic field can be directly accelerated by the laser electric field, uh, and they'll oscillate down the filaments, uh, picking up energy as they go, and as they curve in the very strong magnetic fields, they'll emit gamma radiation. Uh, so we've turned this uh, magnetic filaments, uh, for, uh, uh, that's what we're calling this phenomenon, um, and uh, one particular area of interest is this gamma radiation. Uh, it can be very efficient and very high energy. So shown on the right is a 3D PIC simulation of a uh, 5 times 10 to the 22 watts per square centimeter laser interacting with a relativistically transparent plasma. Uh, and what's being shown is the photon emission um, for photons above 30 MeV in this case. Uh, so the color scale is photons above 30 MeV. You can see that it is concentrated. Most of the emission is around where the electrons are uh, curving most strongly in their orbits. Um, and uh, plotted on top here is also uh, showing an electron as it's orbiting down the filament and radiating. Uh, right. 
So in summary, magnetic filaments promise a repeatable and efficient laser-driven source of megatesla fields, relativistic electrons, and MeV photons. Uh, in this platform, intense lasers in a relativistically transparent plasma generate ultra-strong magnetic fields that trap and accelerate electrons. Uh, these rel relativistic electrons, uh, as they interact in the ultra-strong magnetic fields, will efficiently radiate MeV scale photons. So recently, uh, uh, I derived scaling laws uh, for this magnetic filament radiation uh, and validated those scaling laws with 3D PIC simulations, uh, and I'll show you the results of that. Um, we predict that we can achieve efficiency of greater than 10% from laser energy into radiated photons uh, for intensities above 6 times 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter uh, with an appropriately designed target. Um, we also have performed experiments on the Texas petawatt laser to test these predictions. Uh, and uh, in the results of those experiments, we observe the predicted electron and photon signatures uh, in a subset of the experiments. Uh, so this work uh, is a large collaboration, uh, both with us here at LLE, as well as with uh, people at UCSD, um, HZDR in Germany, Eli NP, uh, the Texas Petawatt Laser, General Atomics, uh, and Johns Hopkins University. So thank you to all of my collaborators on this work. Uh, so I'll start by talking about relativistic laser plasma interactions, uh, specifically relativistic transparency. Uh, so classically, uh, lasers can only interact with plasmas below a critical density. Uh, so this critical density uh, is shown in this definition on the left here. Uh, it's a function of the um, of the, the uh, of the plat of the frequency of the laser, um, and what happens is that if the laser is, if the laser frequency is below the uh, this critical this plasma frequency, um, then the laser is rejected. The electrons are able to just oscillate and reflect the laser light back at. And what that does is that um, produces a uh, that just reflects the light and it can't penetrate into the plasma. Um, so we can invert this uh, equation here and get the definition of the critical density. You can see that it's a function of the electron mass. Now, throughout this talk, I'm going to be uh, referring to laser intensity um, using this term A0. Uh, A0 is a normalized laser amplitude. Uh, the definition is given up here in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, so it is the, uh, it's uh, basically the electric field of the laser um, divided by the, um, the relevant, um, uh, let me say this a different way. Uh, what it is is that um, it, it's a ratio of the energy that is given to an electron uh, within a single uh, oscillation of the laser divided by the mass energy of that electron. So what that means is that uh, if this vet quantity A0 is greater than 1, it implies that the electrons oscillating in the field are going to be relativistic. Uh, they will be moving at or near the speed of light. Um, and then uh, also in practical units, here's a definition of A0 here. You can see it scales with in the square root of laser intensity, uh, specifically for uh, optical lasers that we commonly use uh, that are around one micron wavelength. Uh, you end up with A0 of 1 at intensities of around 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter. Right. So that's classically. But um, if we have, if we're able to push the intensity uh, higher and higher up to the point that this normalized laser amplitude exceeds one, then the electrons are going to be moving relativistically. And what that means is that they get a relativistic boost to the uh, to the uh, effective electron mass. So that comes into the critical density formula uh, as of this uh, function, the Lorentz gamma here. The Lorentz gamma is uh, on average roughly equal to this normalized laser amplitude. And in this case, the dispersion relation changes and your laser is able to penetrate into the over critical, uh, excuse me, into the critical density plasma. Uh, so here's a uh, picture of that uh, in a 3D PIC simulation. Um, uh, this is just showing that relativistic transparency allows an intense laser pulse to propagate into an overdense plasma. Uh, this is from a simulation performed by Alex Arafiev, um, and it's showing a uh, laser uh, incident onto a plasma slab with uh, intense normalized laser amplitude of about uh, 100. Um, and this plasma slab is at 50 times the critical density. So classically, this laser would not be able to penetrate in. However, due to the relativistic transparency effect, uh, it is able to penetrate in and interact with this plasma volume. 
Um, however, uh, this sort of relativistically transparent propagation uh, is unstable. Um, what happens is that the tightly focused laser pulse uh, expels electrons laterally. You can see that in the blue contour of electron density here. Um, and this results in the channel uh, in the laser propagation um, deflecting randomly as it propagates in the forward direction. Uh, you can see that in the second cartoon here where the laser is um, getting randomly deflected in this case up. Uh, but in experimental uh, in experiments, uh, for example, on the Omega EP laser performed by Louise Willingale, um, uh, we see the, or they see that the uh, these deflections are in effectively random directions. Um, so this breaks the symmetry of the interaction, um, and that makes this uh, potentially a challenging thing to study and use. Um, one way around that uh, that we use here uh, is we can regain the stability of the interaction by using a structured target. Uh, so in this case, a filled channel acts as a waveguide for the intense laser. Uh, so uh, now, instead of just having a uniform plasma slab uh, at above critical density, we have a uh, above critical density channel that is surrounded by solid walls. And now, as you can see that as the laser is propagating down this channel, not only does the, uh, do the channel walls act as a waveguide, uh, preventing the laser from deflecting up or down, and so it has to continue down the channel, uh, it also provides a source of cold electrons uh, that can be injected in to keep the uh, density in the channel high. Uh, so this kind of structured target enables an effective long-term volumetric interaction with an overdense plasma, uh, and that's what we're going to be using uh, in this research. Uh, so I'll move on now to talk about uh, relativistically transparent magnetic filaments specifically uh, and the radiation produced by them. So uh, I talked about this on the title slide, uh, but just to repeat myself, in relativistically transparent magnetic filaments, the ponder motive force drives a relativistic current. Uh, so shown on the left is a um, 3D PIC simulation performed in this paper by Zheng Gong from 2020. Um, and you can see, uh, again, you have a laser incident at the front surface of one of these channels. Uh, the electron density in the channel, in this case, is about 1.5 times the critical density, and the laser has an intensity, uh, a normalized amplitude of about 50. So this is relativistically transparent, and the laser propagates down the channel, confined by the solid walls. Um, as it's propagating down the channel, it drives a current density that you can see in the uh, second figure here. Um, the blue indicate, you can see that the electrons are pushed forward. This produces a negative current density, uh, basically volumetrically filling the channel. Uh, you can also see that there's a return current uh, in a narrow sheath around the edges on the channel walls. Um, and, um, what the, and this uh, current density, of course, uh, produces an azimuthal magnetic field that wraps around that current density. Uh, now, the strength of this magnetic field um, can be quite high. Uh, if we take the, if we calculate that strength, uh, and we, uh, in terms of the magnetic field of the oscillating laser, uh, we can perform that calculation. And what we get out is this term here, um, where you, it is uh, defined in terms of the radius of the channel uh, or the radius of the laser focus. Um, and in terms of uh, this parameter uh, that I call the relativistic transparency parameter. What this is, is it's the electron density divided by the critical density of the plasma and divided by uh, the normalized laser intensity. Uh, here, beta is the, um, is the uh, current velocity um, normalized to the speed of light, um, and that's going to be uh, close to one. So uh, we call that, uh, just for future reference, uh, we call this the relativistic transparency parameter and designate it S alpha. Um, and you can, uh, you can see in the simulation here that the strength of these magnetic fields, uh, these azimuthal magnetic fields, get up to, uh, in this case, uh, about 20% of the strength of the driving laser field. So this scales with the driving laser. If we increase the, um, the amplitude of the driving laser, we also increase the strength of these fields. Um, and they're on the same order of magnitude as the oscillating laser field. Uh, this means that uh, in this case, uh, they're very strong. Um, and what those do is they trap electrons in the channel. Um, so that's shown in the cartoon on the right. Uh, this is again, 
uh, electron path tra trajectory traces from uh, the same simulation from the Zheng Gong paper in 2020. Um, and they found uh, in this work that the electrons, as they oscillate down the channel, they're actually trapped inside of a uh, of a radius. Uh, and that, ra that radius um, uh, is, we call it the magnetic boundary. Um, and this paper includes a formula for what that radius is. It ends up depending on the initial tangential um, momentum of the electron. So you can think of this as an electron on axis gets kicked by the laser. Um, it has some initial um, tangential momentum. As it goes, as it propagates outward, it bends in the magnetic field, and that prevents it from going uh, beyond this magnetic boundary radius. Um, if we, instead of using these units, if we instead choose to write it in terms of the relativistic transparency parameter, we can do that. Um, and I've introduced here a constant um, Fi, uh, which is just the ratio of this average tangential momentum to A0. And we expect that should be on order one. Uh, now, what this means is that the maximum magnetic field seen by the electrons is limited either by this magnetic boundary, or if the laser focus is smaller this than this magnetic boundary, it's limited by the laser focus. Um, so, as the electrons are propagating down the channel and they're accelerating, you can see in this cartoon, we show the um, what the um, Lorentz factor for the electrons are uh, as they're orbiting down this channel. And you can see that uh, they get accelerated with uh, very strong effective gradients, where we go from uh, over the course of about 60 microns here, we have electrons being accelerated in this case up to um, Lorentz factors above 1,000, while still being trapped in this magnetic boundary. Uh, and as they orbit down the channel, um, as I showed on the title slide, uh, they radiate. Um, they radiate. They tend to radiate where the magnetic field is strongest, uh, because um, this is effectively the synchrotron process that's going on here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, as they're accelerating down the channel, uh, while they are in the uh, strongest parts of the magnetic field, uh, they t they can radiate photons very efficiently um, at a very high energy. So, uh, so far. Uh, up until this point, most of the work had been done using uh, 3D PIC simulations, uh, which is a very effective tool in terms of getting at the details of this kind of process. Um, but um, I wanted to take a step back and say, well, what can we um, what can we learn about uh, the important elements of this process uh, by trying to come up with a um, like an analytical derivation for the kinds of radiation we should expect to see from this. Um, and I'll, uh, so, I, so I did this using simple assumptions for the electron acceleration in orbits. Uh, we derived scaling laws for the radiation from the magnetic filaments. And I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. Um, if you're interested in more detail, uh, I will refer you to this, uh, this manuscript um, that is currently on the archive. Uh, it's been submitted to New Journal of Physics and is currently in review. Uh, but you can get an early peek at it um, by going to this link here. So, uh, in deriving these scaling laws, we made the assumptions uh, listed on this slide. First, that the electrons are thermal. Uh, so, we assume that they're in a thermal distribution, and that thermal distribution changes with time. Uh, so, we can describe them as a, um, as a Maxwellian uh, with a temperature. Um, and then also, the number of electrons is defined by the density of electrons in the channel uh, times the volume of the overlapping laser pulse. So then we have to talk about how the temperature changes with time because the electrons are accelerating. Uh, so we make the further assumption that the electron acceleration is linear in time. So we can define this temperature basically as a constant times the normalized laser intensity, which should set the uh, metric for uh, should set the scale for how rapidly the acceleration progresses, um, and then just times the normalized time. Uh, time in this case normalized to the laser wave to units of the laser period. Um, yeah. Uh, so further assumptions are that the radiation is synchrotron-like. Uh, so we use the synchrotron formula given here. Uh, this depends on the strength of the magnetic field um, in units of the critical or the Schwinger magnetic field. Um, and it also depends on this um, uh, 
critical radiation energy, which is given by this formula here, um, and scales with the Lorentz factor squared because chi is, uh, I didn't define it here, my apologies for that, but chi is the, this normalized magnetic field times the Lorentz factor. Uh, lastly, uh, I have to make an assumption to figure out when this interaction stops. Uh, so I assume that the laser depletes by heating the electrons. Uh, so we can take the energy in the electrons divided by the energy in the laser, say that has to be less than one, and use that to derive uh, when this acceleration should cut off, so what the cutoff time should be. Uh, I, we further define a, um, uh, we, we add a scaling factor in here to account for the fact that um, that uh, the energy is not just going into electrons, it's also going into other, there are other losses as well. So. Uh, so we include this uh, constant scaling factor ft. So what this ends up giving us is we have four constants, um, the uh, tangential, the initial tangential momentum of the electron, this cutoff time, um, the uh, something I call the uh, radiation duty cycle, uh, that's this fr here. This accounts for the fact that the electrons are not always radiating, they're only radiating over part of their path length. Uh, and then finally, this constant for the, uh, the acceleration. Uh, so those are four constants, and we also have four design parameters. Um, they are the laser intensity, the um, relativistic transparency parameter that I defined before, and then just the radius and the pulse duration of the laser. So from these assumptions, we can then go ahead and derive scaling laws for um, moments of the radiated photon spectrum. Um, and those are shown on this slide here. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail because it's tedious but uh, to look at equations um, in a presentation like this. But um, what we were able to derive was terms for the characteristic photon energy uh, that is radiated from the interaction, um, the total amount of energy that's radiated into photons. And then from those two parameters, we can further calculate the number of radiated photons and the efficiency of radiation, uh, which is just defined as the uh, total radiated energy divided by the laser energy. Um, and um, you'll recall that I said that uh, there, are actually, there are two limits uh, in terms of the focal radius. Uh, if, the, um, if the electrons are, um, excuse me, if the focal radius is smaller than the magnetic boundary, uh, then we get the set of scaling laws on the left. And if the focal radius is larger than the magnetic boundary, uh, then the electrons are still limited by the uh, magnetic boundary instead of the focal radius, and we get the scaling laws on the right. And you can see, uh, just from an uh, initial takeaway here, that these scale very strongly with laser intensity. Uh, so, uh, so this normalized laser amplitude A0, uh, we have the total radiated energy scales like that to the fifth power, uh, and the efficiency of radiation scales like that to the third power, um, as does the uh, characteristic photon energy. So that, that's all well and good from a theoretical perspective, but then you always have to ask the question, well, how well does this theory actually do? So in order to test that, uh, we compared them to a series of 3D PIC simulations. Uh, these 3D PIC simulations varied the focal radius. Uh, they're written up in this paper by Tao Wang, uh, published in 2020. Um, and so here are the parameters used in those simulations. Um, they had a laser intensity of 190, uh, which is 5 times 10 to the 22 watts per square centimeter. Uh, they used a relativistic transparency parameter of 0.1, um, and uh, they varied the um, they varied the focal spot radius from uh, 0.65 to 2.1 times the laser wavelength. Uh, so uh, shown in the middle here is the uh, characteristic distribution of radiated photons. Um, I didn't talk about this before. I probably should have, but. Um, the radiated photons uh, tend to go into two lobes in the forward direction that are split along the axis of polarization. Um, and so um, by summing up all of the radiated photons and dividing by the laser energy, we're able to get the efficiency, which is shown on the right here. Now you can see that as we vary the radius uh, in these simulations, the efficiency uh, scales up to a maximum of about 20% radiation efficiency uh, for the um, for the uh, radius of uh, 1.4 point, um, and then kind of stays constant there. So, uh, in comparing the scaling laws to these 3D PIC simulations, we actually find that we get very good agreement. 
Um, so that's uh, that's really good news for the scaling laws. Um, specifically, uh, we did have to vary the constants. You remember that I mentioned there were uh, constants uh, necessary to completely define these scaling laws. Um, but uh, by um, varying those constants, we're, we were able to get a good fit to the uh, simulations in terms of the irradiated photon energy, uh, in terms of the total radiated energy, in terms of the number of photons radiated, and in terms of the irradiation efficiency. And you can very clearly see here the uh, difference between the two regimes of operation, the regime where the um, laser focus is smaller than the magnetic boundary on the left here, and the regime where it's larger than the magnetic boundary on the right. Uh, and you can see that that regime, you can see that regime clearly in all four of these comparisons. Uh, now I mentioned that these constants are reasonable. Uh, I'll just go through them briefly to try and convince you of that. So you'll remember that we had an initial electron momentum scalar um, that I said was approximately unity. Uh, in order to fit the data, that ended up having to be about 1.5. Uh, it's possible that this is implying that the electrons that start out with more energy um, end up being more dominant in radiation down the line. Um, but it is of order unity, so that's uh, that's what we expected. Um, the cutoff time scalar is about 0.3. Uh, you'll recall that um, I, I derived the um, cutoff time just as all of the laser de depleting into the electrons, which ignores um, all other loss processes. And so um, this would include other loss processes such as heating, um, heating carbon or hydrogen in the channel, uh, as well as the radiation itself. And then lastly, it requires a radiation duty cycle of about um, 20 percent, uh, which is just suggesting that the electrons are radiating during only 20 percent of their orbits, which uh, seems reasonable from looking at the oscillating paths. So that's all good news. Um, the proof, of course, is in the pudding. And so we wanted to go out and start developing an experimental campaign in order to show that this is a real phenomenon that happens in the world and not just in our computers. Uh, so to do that, uh, we performed initial experiments um, at the Texas Petawatt laser. Uh, these were shots that were granted through the uh, LaserNet US call for proposals. Uh, the Texas Petawatt laser is a TISAF laser uh, in, at the University of Texas, Austin. It delivers laser light with a wavelength of 800 nanometers. Um, and in our campaign, we were able to get approximately 100 joules of laser light uh, in a uh, 140 femtosecond pulse uh, with a peak power of about 700 terawatts. Uh, this translated into an intensity on target of about 1 times 10 to the 21, which in terms of the normalized laser amplitude is about a naught of 30. Um, we also measured the uh, radius. Uh, the radius at 50% peak intensity of our focused spot was about 2.6 microns. Um, and the, there was also some variation in the pointing of the laser. Uh, the pointing stability ended up being about 5 micron RMS on target. So, um, I talked about uh, using structured targets for this, where we have a, um, where we have a uh, approximately critical density plasma filling a solid density uh, channel. Uh, in practice, the way that we accomplish that is using microchannel targets that are shown here. Uh, so uh, these microchannel targets were developed by our collaborators at General Atomics. Uh, these particular ones used in the experiment were laser drilled in Kapton. So shown on the left here, you can see the macroscopic view. Uh, we have a wedge of Kapton. Uh, zooming in on that, you can see that it is covered by an array of laser drilled channels. Uh, these channels have six micron diameter and are separated by about 15 microns. Zooming in even further, we record an electron microscope image uh, this is after they have been filled with low density CH foam. Um, we chose low density CH foam with a density of 15 or 30 milligrams per cubic centimeter. Um, and in the electron microscope image, uh, you can see that there is some structure on the surface of the target that is uh, residual foam on the surface. Uh, we were able to demonstrate uh, using two methods that the foam does penetrate into and fill the channels. Uh, both by uh, bisecting uh, one of the targets and showing that foam uh, was at all depths in the channels that we looked at, and also by putting some sticky tape on the surface and pulling them out and observing that uh, columns of foam were pulled out of the channels. So uh, these are the targets that we used. Um, the 
low density foams uh, correspond to a electron density when fully ionized of five or 10 times the equilibrium density in the channel. Uh, and uh, after performing the shots at Texas Petawatt, we were able to achieve 11 shots uh, that had good laser target alignment. Um, and the breakdown of those is given here. We had five shots uh, with the channels filled with five times n crit fill. We had three shots with the channels filled with 10 times n crit fill. We had one unfilled channel that we had a successful shot on. And we had two shots where we shot a planar 10 times critical density uh, foam slab. Now, those of you who have been paying close attention will note that given the pointing stability, uh, which has five micron RMS, uh, as compared to the channel radius, which was three microns, uh, we do not expect to have channel interactions on every shot. And I will come back to that um, after I show the experimental data. So on these experiments, uh, our primary diagnostics were an electron spectrometer. This is an EPPS spectrometer uh, de developed by Hui Chen and on loan from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, in the cartoon of the experiment, the laser comes in along the laser axis, it is polarized vertically, uh, and it strikes our channel target. Um, in that perspective, the electron spectrometer was off the axis of the channel by 20 degrees in the non-polarization direction. And the other diagnostic, a gamma calorimeter, was fielded off the axis of the channel in the polarization direction. Now, the reason for that, again, is that uh, in this uh, magnetic filament radiation, uh, the characteristic shape is that the photons are radiated into two lobes that are separated along the polarization direction. Um, I showed this before for a simulation in which the polarization direction was horizontal. In this case, it is vertical. Uh, and you can see that in comparing the, um, well, you can see that we positioned the uh, X-ray detector such that it would pick up uh, photons that were radiated in the upper lobe. Um, What's being shown here is simulated X-ray profiles uh, using the post-shot conditions from the experiments on Texas Petawatt. Uh, so the left one is the case for a five times critical density filled channel, and the right one is the case for the laser hitting a hundred times critical density planar slab, uh, which is not re relativistically transparent. You can see that in the latter case, we also have these sort of two lobes radiation, characteristic radiation pattern, but uh, they're radiated at much higher angles because the electrons have not been accelerated uh, forward by the magnetic filament uh, interaction. We also observe in the simulations a factor of five difference in photon brightness that is predicted between the microchannel and the solid targets. So what did we see when we did these experiments? Uh, so shown on the left is an inferred electron temperature uh, from our electron spectrometer uh, on the 11 shots. Shown on the right is an example of the electron spectra. Um, so in particular, the ones that are shown here is the, um, the cases that had the 15 milligrams per cubic centimeter fill. That's the uh, five times critical density fill. Uh, you can see that the electron spectra have a two temperature distribution. So in order to analyze this, we fit a slope uh, in the low energy region, and we fit a slope in the high energy region, and those points are plotted in the plot on the left here. So, looking at this data in more detail, the X's represent the T1, the low temperature distribution, and they are all um, th they all match relatively well with this predicted value um, just based on um, the hot electron scaling from uh, I think it's the reference is uh, Haynes, um, who has a PRL on that subject. Um, the hot electron temperature, uh, this T2, is shown in the points up here. Um, and you can see that the, this T2 value, this hot electron temperature value, was elevated on two of the eight microchannel shots, specifically shot number two, which was a five times critical density uh, channel, and shot number seven, which was a uh, 10 times critical density channel. Um, I include the planar slabs here. I'm ignoring them for the time being. So, so what could explain this? Uh, well, uh, if we this is consistent with the predicted behavior uh, from 3D PIC simulations. Uh, so now I've included in the plot a, um, a 3D, the results of 3D PIC simulated electron spectra analyzed in the same way. Um, you can see that 
for the laser interacting with a uh, five times critical density fill, we get a point that matches very closely with shot number two. For the 10 times critical density fill, we get a point that matches very closely with shot number seven. And if we run a simulation with a near solid density, uh, laser interacting with a near solid density, we get a value that corresponds roughly to uh, all of the uh, remaining values. So tentatively, we can infer this as meaning that the laser interacted with the channel on two of the eight shots. Uh, now, does that make sense? Well, given the pointing stability and the channel size, uh, it turns out that it does. Uh, the probability of observing n interactions uh, is given in this table here. This takes into account the um, pointing stability and the size of the channel. Um, and you can see that the probability of getting more than get, getting at least one interaction is about 80 percent. The probability of getting specifically two interactions is calculated to be about 27 percent. And that's actually the second most likely possibility. Uh, so we conclude from this that the predicted electron acceleration was observed in this subset of the experiments. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, fielded this uh, gamma calorimeter. Uh, unfortunately, the calorimeter was designed for a higher energy photon spectrum than we observed, so we don't have a detailed photon spectrum, but we do still have a photon brightness above 10 keV that can be measured. Uh, and that's shown in this plot on the right here. Um, so plotting the photon brightness observed by GCAL versus the electron, hot electron temperature, you see that uh, there is a uh, trend where the, um, specifically the hottest, um, the hottest electron temperature shot was also the brightest. And that difference in range is about a factor of five, uh, which is predicted, which is as predicted by these simulations. Uh, so that's our that's the results of our experiments. Um, I'm going to move on now to close with talking about how we can do this better in future experiments and some of the prospects for um, using this for uh, this platform for physics studies. Um, so for future experiments, um, we have already developed uh, closely packed channel arrays uh, to improve the repeatability and control over channel properties. Uh, these uh, have been developed by our collaborator Alex Hayde at General Atomics. Um, the design is we have the same six micron diameter channels, but instead of being separated by 15 microns, they're only separated by eight microns. And this means that the wall in between the channels is about two microns thick. Uh, Shown on the right is a picture of one of these objects uh, having been 3D printed by two photon polymerization. Um, and uh, we also have a process that is currently being developed to print these with foam already inside of them. Um, so that will be a, that should be a very robust and repeatable uh, version of these targets for our future experiments. Uh, we have also considered uh, and are uh, working on developing the idea of using a compound parabolic concentrator uh, or CPC target. Um, this kind of design has been developed um, uh, using Omega EP and using NIF ARC. Uh, Andy McPhee published this paper uh, in 2020 showing uh, um, the uh, design for one of these for use on NIF ARC. Um, and you can see that it allows in simulations, it allows uh, that laser to uh, achieve significantly higher uh, peak intensities on the target. Um, in our case, instead of using it to, well, it, it would we would benefit from getting the higher intensity, but the main goal is to make, to allow us to repeatably couple um, our laser into a single defined microchannel. Uh, so we don't have to worry about the um, stochasticness of the laser um, hitting just one of our channels and we can instead um, uh, have confidence that it's interacting with a particular one. So this is another path forward for this uh, to improve our results. So where is this all going? Um, at the um, Texas petawatt scale, at, at the um, at the scale of experiments we've been able to do so far, um, the results of the radiation are not um, uh, terribly exciting. Uh, but the whole goal of developing these scaling laws was that it allows us to look at the design of how we can use this to, for example, develop uh, exciting high flux gamma ray source. 
Uh, so shown here uh, is a table uh, where I have taken the laser properties from two 10 petawatt power, uh, two 10 petawatt lasers uh, that are uh, going to become available soon. And that's the Eli NP laser and the Eli Beamlines L4 laser. Um, so the properties of those lasers are shown up here at the top. Uh, assuming each of them is able to deliver five times 10 to the 22 watts per square centimeter, um, I can then uh, take those values, plug them into my scaling laws, and come up with a prediction for how that would perform um, in terms of radiation from this magnetic filament uh, source. Um, so we can make a design choice on what the density of the channel is that affects this relativistic transparency parameter. Um, and by controlling that design choice, we can control the properties of the source. So for example, uh, if we set that choice at the um, at this value 0 0.01, uh, which is predicted to be a lower threshold for this interaction to operate, um, uh, we predict that we can get photons up to uh, 60 MeV on Eli MP or up to almost 100 MeV on Eli beamlines from this interaction. Um, if instead we use a higher density channel, uh, we can trade off the energy of the photons being produced in order to get more photons out of the channel. Um, and I'll point out that the efficiency that is predicted from each of these uh, cases is well in excess of 10% laser energy into radiated photon energy, uh, making this an extremely efficient source. Um, in fact, for three of these four cases, uh, we had to modify the uh, scaling laws in order to account for depletion uh, of energy into the radiation and not just into the electrons. Uh, so that's, uh, that's um, I would hazard that that's a, a pretty exciting possibility to have these high energy gamma sources, uh, but there's a lot of really exciting things that uh, we think we can do with this, uh, with this interaction. Uh, and I'll go through some of them here. Um, so one of these is bright Wheeler pair production. Uh, so from this recent paper by uh, he in uh, published uh, very recently uh, this year, um, they investigated what would happen if you had uh, two lasers, uh, two intense laser pulses that were um, propagating in opposite directions down the same channel. Uh, and both of them are going to accelerate electrons, and then those electrons are going to scatter photons and interact with the um, with the laser pulse uh, coming the opposite direction. Uh, and they predict that this interaction uh, would produce um, uh, electron-positron pairs. Uh, specifically, it would produce electron-positron pairs in a way that was dominated by the linear bright Wheeler process um, up to uh, laser intensities of about 190. Um, so, uh, so, so that's an exciting scientific area uh, where we can use these to try and study the, uh, the physics of pair production. Um, we can also use this to try and study the physics of magnetic, uh, excuse me, of megatesla magnetic fields in plasmas. Uh, so, um, so I have talked about how these azimuthal magnetic fields scale with the magnetic field of the oscillating laser pulse. Um, and so as you get up to intensities on the order of five times 10 to the 22, these azimuthal magnetic fields also reach the megatesla level, so the 10 to the six Tesla level. Uh, and this is far in excess of magnetic fields that we currently have access to uh, in the laboratory. Uh, it is in fact comparable to the magnetic fields that appear in the, in the, uh, in the atmospheres of neutron stars, for example. Um, so shown here is a, a uh, cartoon from this Tao Wang paper, 2019, of a proposed Faraday rotation measurement to measure this magnetic field directly uh, years using a uh, X-ray free electron laser. Um, as you get up to these very high intensities and very high energies, uh, you actually get into a different regime of um, laser plasma interaction physics, a regime where, for example, the radiation reaction uh, ends up being dynamically important uh, for the collective dynamics of the interaction. Uh, so that this is talked about uh, in a variety of papers, including this uh, Zheng Gong paper from 2019, uh, where he shows that um, if, you propagate, if you propagate this kind of interaction out over a very long uh, distance over a channel that is uh, several hundreds of microns long, um, if you don't include the physics of radiation friction, then the electrons will phase and dephase with the laser 
uh, and will not will the amount of energy that they'll gain will be limited. However, the radiation friction ends up changing the electron orbits, kind of um, scrambling them a little bit and allowing uh, some of them to prevent dephasing and reach much higher electron energies, as is shown in the plot on the right. Um, and lastly, in terms of things you can do with this kind of source, well, if we have an efficient way of converting laser energy into gamma rays, um, which this uh, is predicted to do, then you might be you might imagine doing something like using this as a driver for photofission. So you might be able to use this in order to process spent nuclear fuel uh, and reduce the um, the timeline at, over which it is a hazard from the you know ten thousand years scale. Uh, down to the scale of uh, just the fission products, which is only, you know, less than a thousand years. Um, and this kind of idea has been uh, considered by Toshi Chijima uh, in a recent paper. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting prospect for this kind of efficient gamma ray source. Um, so with that, uh, I'll conclude with my summary. Um, these magnetic filaments promise a repeatable and efficient laser-driven source of megatesla fields, relativistic electrons, and MeV photons. Um, we, uh, I would like to close uh, before before I stop talking. I'd just like to mention that um, at the LLE, we have recently reorganized and formed a new division, uh, the Plasma and Ultrafast Laser Science and Engineering Division, uh, or the Pulse Division, we call it. Uh, and the reason for this is that we, uh, this is in recognition of the idea that um, ultrafast laser science and ultra intense laser science. Uh, is a um, growing area where uh, we uh, need to develop expertise in order to um, perform these kinds of uh, cutting edge research uh, as a research institution. Um, so uh, this, this division currently has four groups. Um, I am the group leader of the Relativistic Laser Plasma Experiments Group, but we also have groups in laser plasma interactions, in laser plasma physics and theory, and in ultra-fast laser plasma diagnostics. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, this kind of innovative science, uh, impactful technology, uh, if you're a student or a postdoc, uh, please come talk to us. Uh, we'll be uh, very interested to have a conversation with you about research in this area. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, so please uh, enter any questions you have in the chat field. And otherwise, uh, I'd like to give Hans a great big Thank you. Applause um, for a very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I saw that there was a question. Let me see if I can pop the chat window yeah, up here. It's from Yuan Shi, who says, uh, nice talk. I have two questions. Are non-Maxwellian hot electron tails more important for the processes, or is the thermal part more important? And I'll Okay. Yeah, I'll start by addressing here. that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, in the, I'll, I'll go back here to the measured electron spectra. Um, so we do observe that the, uh, in, our, uh, in our measurements that the electrons that we see seem to have this two temperature distribution. Um, and when you look at these simulations over much longer periods of time or much more intense interactions, you do see that the whole population of electrons does get accelerated. It's not, it's not just that there's a uh, thermal distribution with a very small tail on the end that's experiencing this acceleration. It does appear that um, the, uh, the, the whole electron population is getting energized by this direct laser acceleration. Um, and it's not exactly a thermal distribution the way that I approximated it as. Those details seem not to matter very much from the um, overall uh, scaling laws perspective, but they do matter quite a bit uh, when you are looking at the um, the details of the three D pick simulations, so and I hope that answers that question. His second question is: In the scaling model, does the filament uh, magnetic field play a direct role, or is it merely causing synchrotron radiation? Yeah. So, um, so that depends what you mean by a direct role. I would argue it's playing a very direct role by confining the electron. Uh, if you did not have the magnetic filament confining the electrons, then the you know they would just spray out in all directions, um, and you wouldn't get this kind of uh, acceleration, direct laser acceleration over many laser periods. Um, it does also uh, play a very important role 
uh, in the scaling laws in terms of the uh, radiation power. So if we look at the synchrotron uh, radiation power, where was it? Here we are. Um, so the, the radiation power uh, depends on this, um, on the magnetic field strength. Uh, if we take this term and we integrate it over the radiated spectrum, uh, which is given, uh, you end up with basically this uh, prefactor times the characteristic energy. And so you end up with the power, the radiated power scales as chi squared. Now, what is, now I mentioned uh, that chi is equal to, it's proportional to this magnetic field uh, that the electron is interacting with times the electron Lorentz factor. So chi squared means that as the electrons are accelerating, that extra energy they pick up uh, increases the radiation power uh, like the square of the energy of the electron. And it also increases, and the radiation power is also increased like the square of the magnetic field. Uh, so, so it does play a very important role in terms of the amount of radiation. So there's also a question from Ronnie Shepard. Uh, maybe this was mentioned, but what is the current density of the accelerated electrons? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the current density of the accelerated electrons is close to the um, uh, close to the channel density of the electrons uh, times some fraction of the speed of light. Um, if you look at in my scaling laws, I approximate it to be um, exactly that. Exactly, uh, I have this beta term in here that I uh, generally end up ignoring. Um, in the scaling laws, although I think it's carried through everywhere that I have um, this relative this transparency parameter. Uh, if we look at this particular simulation, uh, you can do the math in your head and say that, well, the current density uh, here plotted proportional to the critical current density ends up being about 75% uh, of this critical current density, uh, which means that in this case, it ends up being something like um, half of the um, half of E times NE times uh, C. But it is quite close to that um, relativistic limit on what the current density can be. So, hey Hans. Nice, Hi. nice talk. This is Scott. Can I just ask my question instead of typing? Sure. Okay, great. Really great talk, Hans. Thanks so much. No, oh, thank you, Scott. Um, so I had, uh, I guess two questions. One is when, you know, so it's great to see, first of all, comment. It's great to see, you know, uh, Alexi has been working on this for many, for, for a couple of years, and it's great to see a, an experiment to, to, that, to finally be done on this. And it's great. And it's very encouraging. Um, I just wondered, number one, did, did he put the actual Texas pre uh, on this before he actually did a lot of the more recent channel simulations? Do you, do you know? So uh, for the simulations that were performed for the Texas experiments, um, yeah. they they use, do I show those here? Um, I show some of the results, like this is a result of that simulation. I don't show the details of it. Um, so in these post-shot Texas simulations, they use yeah. the, uh, intensity of the laser, the pulse duration of the laser, the measured, you know, radius of the laser spot, all of those details. Uh, they do not have a realistic uh, pre-pulse, though. I see. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. I was and, just wondering how that might affect it. That would be interesting to, to see. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. a very good question because, um, so the pre-pulse is uh, not at an intensity, presumably it's not at, well, for Texas, it definitely isn't at an intensity where it's relativistically transparent, right? So any of the right. laser energy that arrives before the main impulse um, is going to interact with the surface of the target. Uh, yep. And that could have that could have a variety of effects, right? Um, right? As a zeroth order thing, you know, in the simulations, we assume that the channel is filled with a uniform density uh, plasma. In the experiments, it's actually filled with a low density sort of nanostructured foam structure, right? right, right so right, so right. maybe some of this interaction at the beginning isn't such a bad thing because it starts to ionize that foam and let yeah. it assemble. So it looks more like the right, simulations. Right. On the other hand, if there's too much energy, you can imagine there being like hydrodynamic motion that maybe like closes down the channel opening or something. Um, maybe a bubble in front of plasma that kind of somehow yeah. might redirect the, the laser just out of it. To, yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Although I have a, I would imagine that since it is relativistically transparent at the, um, at the design density, you know, if you form a bubble and that bubble is at lower density, I wouldn't expect that that would deflect the relativistically transparent pulse. But right, right. But the, but you do rise from non. You know, there's a, there's there's a there's a continuum, right, between yeah. not being you know and then becoming relativistically transparent. That's so, true. Yeah. yeah so it maybe might it see it off in a one way the, or way. Yeah. Yeah. You do never the, know. So it'd be kind of cool to to do experiments like that, uh, simulations like that. So the second yeah, point was, um, you know, the and so to get to the experiment. It's great, you know, really uh, quite exciting. Um, you know, it, it, it's really encouraging that you got those two shots that, that look like you're kind of getting potentially something. Um, the question, the question for me, it, well, for me, this is, maybe this is a question for you, but basically, this seems like an ideal uh, experiment to just go and do again. Because you've got all the, you know, you, you worked out all the hard stuff, you did this, and usually kind of people you know, do an experiment and then they just kind of move on. But this seems because of the statistical nature of your results are kind of, eh, it's kind of like a little bit on the border. Um, this seems like an ideal candidate to just propose to LaserNet again and say, hey, you know what, we're going to get a great result. If we do this again, we're going to get better statistics and we can have a much more definitive uh, result. So oh, have you thought about that? Yeah, sure. So that, that's a it's, a, it's a good idea. And if shots were apples and we could just pick them from the tree, then that's probably something that we would do. However, we did learn a lot from, um, from doing this the first time. And we learned a lot in a way that will, I think, improve our experiments. So for example, using the, uh, the, the more closely packed targets is a, a, a really basic way to just improve oh, the yeah. success rate, assuming <laughs> that we understand this. And this is something that we are going to do. Uh, our, my collaborator, Toma Tansian, has LaserNet US shot day uh, at Texas Petawatt Laser uh, shot day has has a laser net, laser net us campaign at texas petawatt laser um in january of next year uh so we will be doing this um for that campaign we'll be um uh trying to do this but better i guess would be the way that i say that yeah um, right great also uh, also uh now that we have the um the scaling laws like this analytic this improved understanding of how to design uh, experiments for a given laser intensity or whatever, uh, we can make sure that, for example, the selected foam density is more optimal uh, in order to get uh, high electron acceleration and high radiation efficiency. Got it. That's why you went down to one to five and crit, looks like. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, so in this case, so if, let's see. So I mentioned that we had in these targets, we had five or 10 times critical density uh, with a laser intensity, a, a laser, normalized laser amplitude of 30, which means that this uh -huh. S alpha term, this S alpha term in the, the, the radiation, the, the relativistic transparency term is about, um, it, it's like 20 to 30% uh, for the te Texas experiments. Now, if we go up to the scaling laws um, and we look at that S alpha term, um, in, I think this is the case that matters. Um, you see that the uh, total radiated energy scales like S, like the inverse of S alpha. So mm -hmm. if we go there and we instead, and, and we understand now, okay, we can drop that density by a factor of 10, then yep. we would expect that would automatically lead us to a, a factor of 10 times more radiation uh, in terms right. of energy, in terms of efficiency, as well as higher energy photons being radiated. Um, so, so that nice. kind of knowledge is going to inform our future campaigns. Very nice. Thanks so much. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Scott. So I, I've got a question. Um, so since you're able to produce such massive magnetic fields, um, it'd be really cool to be able to do some uh, interesting atomic physics in those extreme conditions. But I, I also recognize yes. your temperatures are also very high, um, which gets in the way of that. Do, do these magnetic fields um, ex extend out into yeah. the lower temperature regime, at lower temperature areas? So, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So if we go back and look at this um, simulation here, uh, so the magnetic field is confined pretty strongly by the return current uh, along the wall of the channel. 
Um, so I do not think that the magnetic field extends very far out into the channel. In fact, looking at the plot of the magnetic field, you can see that it's basically limited by the channel wall. Um, and that's just because the return current, uh, there's a lot of electrons at the channel wall to carry that return current. Um, so uh, in, in terms of using this for, I think you said atomic physics experiments. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, that's something I haven't thought about uh, in great detail, um, but I would guess that it would that you it would be hard to use this magnetic field for um, like as a as a source for a cold piece of matter like right next door to it, for example. Um, that being said, maybe if you doped something in the channel, um, like something very heavy that wasn't going to get fully ionized, uh, you might be able to do some like hot, dense matter atomic physics um, in these kinds of magnetic fields. Yeah, because you're getting up to like magnetic fields seen like in neutron stars and um, mm -hmm. with very highly magnetized white dwarves. And so I think that there's, there's a lot, lot of really unknown um, like equation of state issues in that regime. And um, it could be pretty cool <laughs> if you could figure out a way to, to actually extract a measure. Yeah. yeah, it's a neat idea. Uh, I'll uh, we'll definitely have to keep thinking about that. Great. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to thank our speaker again. And I'll <laughs> give you a nice applause. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. And hope to see you again here next week.